Good evening and welcome everyone. I acknowledge and celebrate the first peoples on whose traditional lands we meet this evening. Here in Canberra, that is the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also pay my respects to all First Nations people who may be joining us this evening. Your Excellency, Ambassador Gabriela Vicenten, EU Ambassador to Australia, Mr. Stefano Sanino, Secretary General of the European External Action Service, Your Excellency Ambassador Alethea Moral, Ambassador of Spain to Australia, other honoured excellencies, those who have been with us now for some time and those recently arrived, honoured and distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends. My name is Anne McNaughton and I am the director of the ANU Centre for European Studies here at the Australian National University in Canberra. I am delighted to welcome you all to our annual Schumann Lecture. The Robert Schumann Lecture Series celebrates the remarkable achievements of European integration since its modest beginnings in the European coal and steel community announced in a declaration by French Foreign Minister Schumann in 1951. The ANU Centre for European Studies and the Australian National University have recognised the achievement and foresight by coordinating the annual Schumann Lecture since 1996. The first lecture was delivered by Lord Leon Britton, then Vice President of the European Commission. Since then, distinguished speakers have included as he then was, the Right Honourable Chris Patton, CH, Commissioner for External Relations, Dr Cecilia Malmström, then European Union Commissioner for Trade, Ms Connie Hedegaard, former EU Commissioner for Climate Action from 2010 to 2014, Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, AC, KC, then Chancellor of the ANU, and most recently our own EU Ambassador to Australia, Mr. Gabriela Vicentin. We are honoured to again have such a distinguished speaker addressing us this evening. The ANU Centre for European Studies is the oldest research centre in Australia focused on the study of Europe and the European Union. We are also one of the oldest such centres in the region. Our centre is an ANU-wide platform for research and collaboration with Europe, with strong links to government, industry and universities across Australia, the Indo-Pacific region and Europe. Consistently with ANU's mandate as Australia's national university, we also work with colleagues and institutions across Australia, including the University of Canberra, as well as universities such as the Universities of Newcastle and of New England, the University of Southern Queensland, Murdoch University in Western Australia and RMIT in Melbourne. We engage in and promote inter and transdisciplinary research and dialogue and deliver research, education and outreach with the support of the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. I am particularly proud of our track record in this regard holding grants for research across the social sciences spectrum, including the EU's climate change agenda and external trade and investment, implementing climate change policies, closer economic cooperation between the EU and Australia, trade in services, liberal democracy in action, culture in international relations and memory studies. Most recently, we were awarded funding from the EU as part of two research consortia. One evaluates regional perceptions of the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy, and we are working with colleagues here in Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia and Europe as part of that research network. The other research consortium, the EU Research and Education Network on Foreign Policy Issues, Values and Democracy, brings together 21 outstanding higher education institutions from Europe and the world to enhance the debate and improve the knowledge of the values and democracy in the EU's foreign policy. This coalition of nearly 100 academic experts from six continents has identified the need to strengthen the external legitimacy of the EU 
as a force for good in times of contestation. Our network will disseminate research examining EU values and their impact on EU policies such as security, development, trade, climate and sustainable development goals. Today's lecture is part of our own project, Liberal Democracies in Action. True to our transdisciplinary mission, we collaborate with institutes, centres and colleagues across all seven colleges at ANU. Most recently, we partnered with the ANU School of History to organise the Australasian Association for European History Conference last month, the premier conference in modern European historical studies in the Southern Hemisphere. And we have potential future collaboration with a network of historians, including from the ACU and the University of Melbourne. Our Deputy Director, Dr. Karsha Williams, works with colleagues at the Gender Institute here at ANU, most recently co-organising the Gender Institute signature event, Gender, Sexuality and Assaults on Rights in Modern Europe, a series of lectures and a round table to situate reflection on gender and sexuality within a broader framework of European history research. Our annual Schumann Lecture is one of the highlights of our calendar and the speaker and subject of tonight's lecture resonate deeply with our centre's research aims and outreach activities. I'm delighted now to invite His Excellency Ambassador Gabriella Vicenten to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you very much, Anne. Always a pleasure. Uh, thanks to all of you, uh, excellencies, friends, uh, for being here tonight. But uh, before I proceed, I, I would like to as well to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we meet on today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So the Schumann's lecture is a tradition, an a honor tradition, and it's the best a vehicle for amplifying the EU voice in Australia. Thanks, Anne, for this. And this year, the lecture will be particularly insightful. So, Stefano Sannino is visiting Australia for a broad range of engagements with Australian government departments, political thinkers, business community, civil society organizations, to cover the whole spectrum of the competencies and policies of the EU. So his expertise and areas of interest reflect the breadth, not only of the EU, but of the EU-Australia friendship. So Stefano is an incredible diplomat, an insightful strategist, and above all, and what is most relevant for tonight, a real European, a knowledgeable European, a successful European. Just let me tell you that his career spanned all over the spectrum of the EU. And when he engaged in the national diplomacy, he reached the top. He was the EU permanent representative to the EU. Not only, he chaired Coreper too. So it is la crème de la crème. And he experienced the experiences of having uh, to, uh, say, steer um, a very interesting uh, presidency, uh, Italian presidency. So but we can comment about that later on. And then uh, when he joined the European Commission, top there as well, Director General for Enlargement. Finally joined the European External Action Service, number one there as well, Secretary General. So who better than Stefano could give us a Schumann lecture? So uh, without further ado, uh, it's uh, once again my absolute pleasure to give the floor to the EAS Secretary General, Stefano Sannino. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, um, also on, on uh, uh, my side, before uh, proceeding, I want to acknowledge that uh, 
uh, these conferences held uh, on uh, the uh, traditional lands of the um, Gunawal and uh, Gambri people of the Canberra region in primary respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I would like to uh, thank very much the uh, um, Australian National University, its Centre for European Studies. Thank you very much, Anne, for uh, inviting uh, me uh, tonight. You have mentioned a number of uh, uh, very important uh, uh, personalities of the European Union that have preceded me, much more uh, relevant, including the one that brought me into the uh, uh, European institutions, Chris Patton, that has been, let's say, my commissioner of reference when I started working in uh, the cabinet of the then president of the um, uh, European uh, Commission, Romano Prodi. Um, I think it, we are in a very, um, um, yeah, let's say, crucial moment of uh, uh, international relationship. And while I was um, uh, preparing these notes for, uh, for this conference, um, just uh, uh, recalled the, uh, um, the, the first ever EU uh, strategy, security strategy, which was adopted in December 2003. I would like to read to you the first sentence of uh, this strategy, 2003, not too long ago. Europe has never been so prosperous, so secure and so free. The violence of the first half of the 20th century has given way to a period of peace and stability unprecedented in European history. It was not too long ago, again, 20 years, and it was not, let's say, at the time, a, a lack of understanding of the situation. We were really in a moment for the uh, European Union, which was extremely uh, favorable and positive. And we were speaking like, in general about the end of history and um, a world that was reconciled, globalization, and so on. Um, and I mean, if we had to write 20 years after um, uh, the uh, new security strategy, we should write something, unfortunately, uh, um, very different. I see here a Ukrainian flag, um, and uh, war is back in Europe, is back on uh, the European continent. A war that um, um, is an existential threat to uh, um, our continent, especially for those member states who are uh, bordering uh, uh, Russia and that are very close to uh, the, uh, uh, and, and very directly threatened by, by Russia. But also a war that is a, a, a threat to the whole world because it is a, a deliberate and unprovoked aggression against a country, against a sovereign country, because it is a challenge to uh, the rules of the international orders that um, we together have built after the um, Second World War, trying to replace rules with force, and because the consequences of this aggression are uh, felt all, all over the world. Think what is happening in uh, Africa or in other continent, the, uh, um, rise of agricultural prices, the uh, rise of uh, cost of energy. Um, so something that is not only affecting us directly, but um, again, all the countries of the world. Uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine has also been a catalyst that has generated uh, what have been defined tectonic shifts in uh, the um, uh, international relations. And I'm not thinking only uh, um, uh, about the uh, uh, no uh, uh, limit partnership between uh, um, China and Russia. The whole uh, world has changed and the way we are dealing with the whole world has changed. And we have dramatically realized in this situation that security uh, is no longer a legionary affair and it has become global from the Indo-Pacific to uh, the Atlantic, uh, the security theater has become one, and there is no sanctuary left. It is not a chance that um, um, we see a proliferation of strategies uh, that are written in all our uh, countries in different continents, security strategies, Indo-Pacific strategies, China strategies, 
And this is an indication that um, we are all reflecting on how we want to position ourselves in this complex world that we are living in. And as European Union, we are not an exception. We have uh, elaborated an Indo-Pacific strategy, a China policy paper, and in both of them, uh, we have stressed the importance of working with partners. I quote again the uh, 2003 EU security strategy, and this time uh, the uh, still stands, because uh, it was said that no single country is able to tackle today complex problem on its own. And I think that this is still uh, the case. And this is even uh, uh, more true because, and uh, this is my second point, the security concept has changed enormously. Um, for quite some time, we had forgotten the military dimension of security. We had thought that it had become almost irrelevant. And then uh, uh, this dimension has made a dramatic comeback. And uh, we have all become, all of a sudden, military experts. And uh, um, this is very evident in uh, um, what has happened uh, in terms of budgets. All the countries of the European Union have increased enormously the uh, um, uh, defense budgets. Um, Denmark has rejoined the uh, military uh, uh, structures of the European Union. Finland and uh, Sweden have asked to join NATO. Finland is already in. Hopefully, Sweden uh, will join soon. Um, we have started speaking again of the uh, military industrial sector, the need to ramp up our industrial capacity. And the military alliances have become central again. NATO has become the, uh, uh, has regained a centrality in the uh, um, world scene. But alongside with the military dimension, um, our security is being threatened in many other ways. Manipulation of information and interference, cyber attacks, hybrid attacks, instrumentalization of um, policies. Think about the uh, number of false narratives that are um, spread around uh, in uh, traditional and social media. Think about the attacks that um, uh, are done to our critical infrastructures. Think about the instrumentalization of policies like energy, that has been done by Russia, or about uh, uh, food security, the recent bombings, the um, um, grain silos in, uh, in Ukraine. Think about the use of corruption to influence political processes. And um, if everything is being weaponized, we uh, uh, must frame our policies accordingly. We need an integrated security approach, a holistic approach that addresses comprehensively all uh, these areas. There is another dimension which is extremely important, and is one of the economic security. The challenge in this area is huge because we need to manage better the risks while ensuring that the openness of our global economy is not endangered. The European Union has uh, recently issued a comprehensive economic security strategy, which is based on uh, three pillars. We like the, uh, the three Ps, promote, protect, and partner. Uh, promote, the, uh, in terms of competitiveness, the uh, European Union economy, um, strengthening the single market, reinforcing the resilience uh, of uh, our economies, invert, investing in skills, fostering research, and uh, um, developing a stronger industrial base. Protect the economy uh, through a de-risking strategy, giving us the means to fight against economic coercion, and I think that you know something about that, enhancing the mechanism to uh, um, screen um, inbound investments, but also um, looking at areas which were not covered before, 
like an enhanced export control mechanism to avoid that the technologies could go uh, into uh, um, areas that are uh, dangerous for us and that could provide an unfair advantage to non-benign third parties. And another element which is also extremely sensitive, which is the uh, screening of outbound investments, an area that uh, we had not touched before and is also becoming extremely um, relevant. And last but not least, the third pillar is about cooperation. Cooperation to do with the broadest possible range of partners, but in particular with allies and like-minded partners like Australia. And we need to stand together. We need to coordinate our efforts and we need to further policies that raise the cost for revisionist powers when these powers work to undermine the principles and the rules on which the international order is based. Geopolitical tensions make it even more important for allies like Australia and European Union to give a positive signal about their joint commitment uh, to an open and rules-based international order. We do appreciate, the European Union appreciates the strong stance that Australia has taken on the Russian's aggression against Ukraine. And it is important to continue our close coordination and joint outreach efforts to make it sure that uh, this alliance and this cooperation stand strong uh, over time. But we want to do more together. We want to go further in uh, our relationship. We want to develop our cooperation in all the areas that I had mentioned before, in all the security matters. I, there are a number of promising areas, from maritime security to uh, cyber security, from uh, foreign interference and information manipulation, to hybrid threats, to counter-terrorism. And it is um, important that we will have, at the end of this year, the first EU-Australia security dialogue as an important step in uh, this direction. We want to build a strong, structured, dense partnership between the European Union and Australia. We believe that um, everything points at uh, moving in that direction. The principles that we share, the interests that we have in common, the challenges that we need to face together. And um, um, I hope that the next time that I will come to uh, Canberra, I won't be asked by journalists, why are you here? And um, um, to uh, the uh, journalist that was asking me this question before I came here, I said, I'm here because I hope that next time that I will come here, you won't ask me this question because you will realize and understand that um, what we need to uh, uh, build together um, is the, uh, uh, what we share in terms of uh, uh, vision and that you will consider that it's natural that I'm here. It's a sort of uh, um, just normal thing, even if it's uh, not an easy travel, it takes a lot of time, but you will find it normal to see someone from Brussels coming here to strengthen the partnership between the uh, European Union and Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. But uh, let me first explain why I'm the ambassador of Spain. And so let me explain why I'm here. And uh, I was given the privilege to say a word of thanks for uh, Mr. Sanin on lecture. Um, as you may know, um, every six months, um, one of the 27 member states of the European Union holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union. And this, uh, the country or the member state who has the presidency has to define uh, identify priorities for the semester and an action plan for the semester. And this semester is Spain holding the president. That's why I'm here talking to you. And uh, well, and after saying this, I want to thank Anne McNaughton and uh, Ambassador Vicentin for giving me the privilege and the opportunity um, 
to, uh, to say or to give this vote of thanks to Mr. Stefano Sanino. It's really a privilege and we are very grateful uh, for your visit to Australia. You came all the way from Brussels to Australia. Thank you so much. And for this very, very interesting lecture, uh, very timely lecture, um, you, you touch very, very important topics, uh, how the world has changed in the last 20 years. Um, um, security is not regional anymore, it's a global concept. It's also a broad concept uh, that has to be um, approached in a holistic way. And uh, how the European Union uh, wants to be really a strategic actor in the international community and a strategic partner. Um, I want to say, I'm not going to talk about the priorities of the Spanish presidency, I just want to say that one of these four priorities of the Spanish presidency is precisely to promote the uh, strategic autonomy and global leadership of the European Union, diversifying suppliers, uh, reducing dependency, um, um, promoting more um, engagement with partners, like-minded partners, and, um, and we would like really, um, um, colleagues, ambassadors accredited here in Australia would like to be perceived, the European Union to be perceived as really a strategic partner for Australia so we can cooperate together to respond to these global challenges. So thank you very much for, for your lecture. And well, I just want to say that I hope that, um, well, uh, the negotiations of the free trade agreement, uh, or there are some issues to be solved, but we hope that finally we will reach an agreement during the Spanish presidency. So thank you very much. Thank you. thank you again so much, Ambassador Moral. It's a wonderful friend of the center. So, in concluding now, I'd like to ask you all to please join me again in thanking our speaker, Mr. Stefano Sanino, as well as our ambassadors, Mr. Uh, ambassador Gabriele Vicentin and uh, Ambassador Alicia Moral for their contributions this evening. As you might expect, an event, like, an event like this doesn't happen by itself, and I want to thank the team from the Research School of Social Sciences and College of Arts and Social Sciences Media and uh, Communications team, the uh, team at the ANU Centre for European Studies, and most particularly my co colleague and uh, Deputy Director, Kasha Williams, and all those who come in support of the centre and the activities and work that we undertake. We have refreshments now. Thanks for the, um, to the EU delegation and Ambassador Vicentin. And I'd invite you all to please come and join us outside to uh, engage with some well-earned uh, refreshments, but also, I hope, to strengthen friendships, to make new ones, and uh, to enjoy the evening. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening. <laughs>